Uh, hello and welcome to the final lecture on the road to the Civil War, the sectional crisis. And uh, this one's going to take us all the way to the end. And we're going to start off with Chief, Chief Justice Taney, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and an important Supreme Court decision that was made at this time. Now, this, the Supreme Court has always been seen as inviolable. Like it's, it's not going to be persuaded by any modus other than what is right and what is right according to the Constitution. And Chief Justice Taney, he's been Chief Justice for a long time, sign, since the mid-1830s. He took over for John Marshall, uh, 30 years. Uh, well, yeah, he's been the Chief Justice, well, we should say 20 years, he's been Chief Justice. And he's from Maryland, a slave state, and he'd owned slaves himself, but he had freed them. And he's welcoming an opportunity to make a final decision. Maybe the Supreme Court is, needs to be the one to make a final decision that can be respected by all Americans and, and put an end to this divisive issue of what is the final say. He has wonderful hair, but yeah, crack a smile there, Justice Taney. All right, so we're going to get a decision, the, the Dred Scott decision. And who is Dred Scott? Well, he, uh, he was a slave, but his master had taken and and, and he'd lived in a free state for a number of years. And he, w he argued that because of that, he should be a free man. Now, his master's died, he's changed ownerships a little bit, and he'd been, there's a little bit more to this story, but it just sort of comes in, you know, is he a free man or not? And the decision comes down. Uh, Dred Scott's not a citizen because he was a slave. Um, therefore, he should never have even had the opportunity to, to argue before first the lower courts and now the Supreme Court. You know, you're, it's, like, it's like a horse coming and making this, this argument here. And uh, so uh, we shouldn't even hear your case, but let's just decide, you know, let's, okay, if we were going to hear your case, what would we say? Well, we would say that you're not free because you are property and the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional because it interfered with people's property and we shouldn't have any laws limiting people's property. And he's sort of making the argument, okay, if you owned a horse, you should be allowed to take your horse into free states and it's still your horse or you know your reaper or your furniture or whatever whatever property when when you take it from one state to another the ownership over that property does not change and cannot be legislated away and so if you take this argument further then slaves are legal everywhere there can be no law against slavery in any state according to this decision and this is a bombshell on, on the North. The South cheers it on. Yes, the Supreme Court has decided and they've decided, you know, we've been saying this all along, to the North, it's, they're aghast. We don't hold the presidency. We've got, a, we've got, we've got the House, but we, the Senate is evenly divided, and now the Supreme Court. They just feel uh, that it's a conspiracy and that slaveocracy, these powerful slave forces are, are destroying their country and forcing slaves upon them. And they feel like we've, we've lost, we don't even, like the Supreme Court, which was seen as like this, uh, almost like God making the final arbitrary decision that, that they've made such a, a terrible decision. Now, the logic behind it, yeah, if slaves are property, then you cannot take away their property. The government can't do that. Um, now, of course, you can make other arguments. Maybe slaves should not be considered property, uh, but that was not the question before the court. The question was, was he a free man? And the decision went down. And, on, you know, the South, South knew that this, this decision was going to come down uh, before it did, and they quite rejoiced. Now, it's within this atmosphere that um, Abraham Lincoln decides he's going to run for office and he's going to run for Senate of Illinois, Illinois Senator. And in his opening uh, speech, he gave his famous A House Divided speech, where he said, uh, he, he used the metaphor of a house uh, as the country. A house divided against itself cannot stand. 
I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states old as well as new, north as well as south. Either slavery is going to stop expanding into the territories and, and die out as an institution where it exists, or we're going to have slaves everywhere, and slavery will have to be one or the other. What is it going to be? So he's putting out you know, his position that slavery will exist where it already is, may not expand into these new territories, uh, but he's not going to, uh, to deny slaves where it already is. That's his position. He's very much a moderate abolitionist. He's a free soiler. Well, he'd been a Whig, and Henry Clay was his hero. There he is giving his speech. And who's he up against? Stephen Douglas, who caused all these problems in Kansas. You know, he's the senator from Illinois, and uh, Lincoln's running as Republican, and Stephen Douglas for Illinois. And Lincoln challenged him to a series of debates. And Stephen Douglas, famous senator, got a lot of connections. Abraham Lincoln, who? Who's Lincoln? Uh, who's this guy? And, you know, if you look at Lincoln, he'd been uh, a one-term congressman, and uh, that's what it... But he, uh, he is known within the legal circles of Illinois. He was a, 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 a traveling lawyer. He would travel around and, and, and help argue, and he's a very popular guy amongst that group. But for most people, they don't actually really know who he is. And in the debates, uh, the position and arguments um, over slavery... Uh, Douglas says slavery is not immoral. Uh, it, it is a terrible economic system, but it's not evil. And he's putting out that, you know, the popular sovereignty, this is the way, you know, and people can vote against it. Lincoln, slavery is immoral. Um, it's a social and political wrong, and we need laws to stop it, to stop its expansion. Douglas wins the election against Lincoln, but Lincoln, through all of this, gained national exposure, and people were seeing him as, as a possible presidential uh, candidate. And for Douglas, he was very much hurt uh, by, uh, by an argument that he made where Lincoln asked him, well, what about the uh, Dred Scott decision? And and Stephen Douglas said, well, it doesn't matter what the Dred Scott decision said. It's all up to popular sovereignty that, you know, the people of a territory, they'll, they'll decide for themselves whether or not they're going to accept slavery amongst, amongst their community. And this alienated a lot of people in Douglas's party from him, peop uh, Southerners in particular, uh, who, who were aghast at this position that he's not supporting the Dred Scott decision uh, and that he's saying it's still up to the people to make their decision. Cost him, cost him dearly did that. And we're going to get at this time, around this time, so, so sorry, with, with this Lincoln, he's, he's uh, not forgotten. This is 58, and 60 is when we're going to get the presidential election. So he's put his name out there, and uh, his, he, he's, his arguments were published in newspapers all around uh, the North, and he's, yeah, he's gaining some attention. And we get over this John Brown. And John Brown, he's the Pottawatomie Massacre guy, uh, and, uh, violent, extremely anti-slavery, and uh, he's um, deeply, deeply religious, and he sees slavery as the worst of sins, and he wants it abolished anyway how, and he's going to try uh, to organize a violent slave uprising in Virginia. Uh, near a place called Harper's Ferry, and his he went with a group of followers, black and white, to uh, an arsenal there, seized a number of weapons, and uh, in the process killed some innocent people. And uh, it was quickly put down. Uh, this there was the slaves who were supposed to uprise. They didn't get the message, and uh, it, the whole thing didn't really go far. And he was put on trial, and he's clearly kind of crazy and insane. And they they could have just locked him away in an insane asylum and said that, you know, the whole thing was, was his insanity. Uh, but instead, he's turned into a martyr as he's sentenced to death. And during the whole trial, he'd, he'd been very dignified. And to Northerners, he was seen as sort of a hero and uh, somebody who's, who died for a just cause. Because what happens to him is he's 
he's sent out uh, to, and he's hanged. And uh, Northerners sort of applaud, not that he was hanged, but that he was a hero. And to Southerners, they're aghast that, they're, that they support this man. And, you know, to, to them, he's a terrorist and an evil, evil man, and that his actions should never, ever be, uh, be applauded. They should be um, in the deplored with the strongest of language. And so this just further uh, divides the two and, and convinces people in the South that the people in the North well, we're, we're not going to stop until slavery sort of ended, and of course the people in the north think the slavery is being shoved down their throats. And now we're going to have our election, and we need for the Republican Party who's going to be the guy. And four people sort of put their their names in the hat: William Seward, Edward Bates, Salmon P. Chase, and Abraham Lincoln. And uh, the first three all have a l good credentials: governors, uh, senators. Um, and Lincoln, no, he's got very little political experience. But that helped him in this case because when you get into politics, you develop enemies. And William Seward's seen as the favorite, and he is, you know, he's getting the most votes on the first uh, voting, but he's not getting enough. And uh, he's, he's nobody's second choice. Whereas Abraham Lincoln was a lot of people's sort of second choice, you know. If, it's, if I can't get my guy, Bates or Chase, who's my compromise? You know, I'll, I'm, I, if I'm for Seward, I'm against Bates and I'm against Chase. If I'm for Bates, I'm against Seward, I'm against Chase. You get the idea? But I got nothing against Lincoln. And Lincoln is that kind of guy. He doesn't make enemies. He makes friends uh, quite easily. He's a very charming guy. And he's, and he's the kind of person who treats people very r respectfully, uh, even when they do harm to him or even when he lose. He's very magnanimous, um, which is being a, a good loser. And he ends up winning because the other three sort of check each other out. And then we get the election of 1860 and the strangest of elections, four people running. Douglas is running for Northern Democrats. They've split over the Lecompton uh, Compromise, or sorry, the Lecompton Constitution and the Dred Scott decision into Northern and Southerners. Um, we got Breckinridge running for the South. We've got the Constitutional Union Party, which wants to uh, amend the Constitution um, to as as a way to settle the issue. I believe so. And, and we can see that it's clearly a north-south, well, north-middle-south, with the north going mostly towards Lincoln, especially in the most populated area up here, uh, and the south going for the Southern Democratic vote. And Lincoln wins, but he's not even on the ballot down in the south. And it's after this that we're going to get the southerners are going to start to secede one by one. Uh, led by South Carolina about a month after the election. And uh, they said, bye, we're seceding. They put out a document explaining their, their reasoning. And they're followed then by these other southern states. Uh, and in January of 61 and February of 61, Lincoln's still not president. Uh, at this time, he was elected in November of 1860. He assumes the office in uh, March of 1861. So it's Buchanan who's president during this time and he doesn't take any measures to stop it. So no fighting sort of happened yet. And they wanted to wait to see for the big ones up here and these ones here as well. Uh, Missouri, Kentucky, West, uh, West Virginia, which is in the state, but they'll break off uh, Maryland and Delaware. These are states that slavery was legal in them uh, but they don't join uh, the Southern cause. And there's not fighting yet. We don't know what it means moving forward of what's going to happen next. Uh, well, of course, we do, but you know, at the time looking for, they didn't really know. It was, it was the lull before the storm, but the storm is fast approaching. All right, thank you very much for listening.